Called, there we are, <laughs> The House That Had Enough. Have any of y'all ever seen that? You have? Good. Uh, have, have, you, have you got one? Well, Joshua, you have something that is very precious because it's out of print. And the cheapest one I could find is $40. So hold on to that book, <laughs> okay? <clears throat> at your house, okay. Well. This is a little girl named Annie. Okay? And Annie lived in a house, a normal looking house. I'm going to let you hold that, Joshua. Okay? Annie lived in a house. It was a nice house. And she had responsibilities that her mom and dad had given her. You know, she was to look after her things, her own things. And she was to help around the house. Well, one day, Annie decided that she was tired of doing that. She just decided not to pick up her toys, not to hang up her clothes, or, or put her dirty clothes in the laundry hamper. If it was her turn to wash the dishes, she just didn't do it. She, didn't, she had gotten to the point she just didn't want to do it, and she didn't see why she had to do it. Well, guess what? Daniel, will you hold Annie? Annie's things started to run away because she wasn't taking care of them. She lost the kitchen sink. Hold that up, Joshua. We're going to put this stuff in here. She lost her, the knives, the forks, and the spoons all ran away. Let's see. Her, her clothes ran away. And she really liked that dress. It ran away. Look. Her shoes, her mirror, her purse ran away. Yeah. Look. Her toys ran away. Now that's getting pretty bad, isn't it? Her toys ran away. Let's see. Her cat ran away. <gasps> My cats never leave home. <laughs> They're afraid they'll miss a meal. <laughs> the dog ran away. <laughs> isn't that funny? Look, look, Mr. Ken, her chickens ran away. <laughs> She quit feeding them. Let's see. This was her inner tube to, to when she went to the swimming pool. It ran away. Uh, let's see. <gasps> What's this? Her Christmas tree ran away. Did it hop? I would have liked to have seen all this stuff running away from her house. Her sock monkey ran away. <laughs> You got a sock monkey? Look, the furniture. The furniture ran away. Look, even the gingerbread man <laughs> ran away. Isn't that funny? And then, look, her garden ran away. I've just got one little flower. But her garden ran away. Everything ran... Ooh, let me put the gingerbread man in there. And then... Guess what? Her house ran away. But you know what? There was one thing left. When her house picked up and ran, and Annie, let's put this over here, thank you. Annie was standing there. What do you think she said? Look, it's all gone. She said, oh, no. Annie was, she didn't look this happy. She was standing there, and there was one thing left on the ground. Right. 
her Bible did not run away. Now, why do you think that is? Because, well, maybe not. Maybe she didn't. Right? What, Alexi? Right, right. So, she was left with her Bible. Now, this kid's corner has a second part to it. The rest of the story. And that's going to be next week. So y'all make, yeah, y'all make sure you're here next week. And we're going to find out. What did Annie do? All she had left was her Bible. Did her stuff come back? We're going to find out next week. Let's have a prayer. To be continued. Thank you, Mason. <laughs> Let's have a prayer. Shh. Heavenly Father, we thank you for everything that you have given us. We ask you for us not to take things for granted and to hold precious in our hearts your holy word. Be with us this week, dear Lord. Be with these boys and girls as they go back home and help them to think twice about their stuff and about when their mom and dad ask them to do something. And help the rest of us, dear Lord, to be conscious of these things. In your name we ask it. Amen. Thank y'all. today. Turn with us to 499. Victory in Jesus. And we're going to do the responsive reading. Read the bold print. Let's stand together as we read from God's Word and sing all three stanzas of 499. For this is what love for God is, to keep His commands. Now His commands are not a burden, because whatever has been born of God conquers the world. This is the victory that has conquered the world, our faith. And who is the one who conquers the world, but the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? In all these things we are more than victorious through Him who loved us. Today you are about to engage in battle with your enemies. Do not be faint-hearted. Do not be afraid, alarmed, or terrified because of him. For the Lord your God is the one who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies.
to give you victory. What then are we to say about the Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, whom you did seem to bring us a victory, Father. You allowed him to die on the cross to save us from our many sins and make it possible for us to live in eternity with you forever. 
thank you so much for that father what a blessing that is father as we gather here today we just pray that you will just continue to bless us you will continue to bless this church in a very special way lord help us to be the kind of church you'd have us to be help us to serve you in the ways you'd have us to do lord each of us to hear this morning <coughs> Each of us to hear this morning, Father, with things on our heart that we pray that you'll help us with, Father. We all have hurts. We all have things in our lives that we will lead your help with. And we pray that you'll help us. We thank you for those that are here that are today, Father, that have made the commitment to be in your house today to serve you and to worship you, Father, in a very special way. Lord, we pray for our country. We pray for our leaders. We pray for the world and all the problems going into today, Father, that only you can solve them. And we just pray that that we'll turn to you, our world leaders, our government, our country, our leaders in our country will turn to you, Father, and that we can live in peace the way you want us to have to do, Father. Just help us to work at that as best we possibly can. Father, just help us know and understand that you're the way that can make us have this, Father. Lord, we pray for the Christians all over the world, those that are being persecuted and those that are being, uh, having their lives lost, Father, because they love you and they care for them. Lord, we know that's hard and terrible, but we also know, Father, that they are in heaven with you today, and their lives are even better, Father. But we just pray that our countries and our world would be a better place to live, Father, and that we'll give you the opportunity to lead us and to guide us by turning our hearts to you, Father, and let you lead us to what you'd have us to go. Now, Father, we just pray that you'd go through us, that go with us this coming week, and help us to do and say the things that we pray in you. For in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's continue singing by turning to 629 through it all. We'll sing this little chorus through two times. Then we'll go right down the page, 630. He included me first and last stanzas only. 629 and 630.
that. At this time, please stand for the doxology number 668. Remain standing for the offertory prayer to follow. Thank you so much for loving us the way you do. Thank you for lavishing on us all the blessings you give us. And you give them over and over and over. And we praise you for it. We pray now, Lord, you'll bless this offering. Father, look, the little bit that we give to your kingdom, we pray you'll multiply it. Combine it with others, uh, the gifts of others, Lord, and multiply it in ways we can't even imagine so that people will come to know Christ. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Evening choir, thank you so much. What was real, I'm not saying anything about the guys. Y'all did a great job. <laughs> but wasn't it really beautiful to hear those ladies singing? That was nice. Well, turn with me please to Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15, I want everybody to, to get there because I want to show you something you might not have known about Luke chapter 15. Uh, in, this, in this chapter, Jesus told three different parables. Three different parables. And, and you'll see there in, in uh, uh, verses 3 through 7, he tells the parable of the lost sheep. And then 8 through 10, he tells the parable of the lost coin. And then the rest of the chapter, he's telling the parable about the lost son. Okay? Now, I want you to see this. You might even want to, you might even want to mark this in the margin of your Bibles. And you kind of look at it and you see this, this is amazing how he did this. In the first parable, he goes from talking about 100 sheep and how the, sh the shepherd left the, the 100 sheep, the 99 sheep, and went looking for one. One out of 100. And then in the parable of the lost coin, he had, we have 10 coins. One of them goes uh, missing. So we have 1 out of 10. And then when we get to the parable of the lost son, one of those sons goes missing. And we have 1 out of 2. And you see how he's constantly focusing that, that uh, down into till he's just telling us over and over again that, there's, that every single person has worth. That he is interested in you. If there's, only, if there's just you, that was enough for him. That was enough for him. One out of a hundred, one out of ten, one out of two. He cares for us that much. Now we're going to re begin reading. Today we're going to focus on the parable of the lost coin. And, um, and we'll come back to the same passage next week. Uh, Judy told me that the kids' corner was going to have two parts to it. This was part one and next week part two. I said, well, if I can do that with sermon, I guess you can do it with, uh, with the kids' corner too. Just don't try it with the choir. It'd be kind of hard to have... Kind of hard to have half of a song one Sunday and the other half the next Sunday. Well, stand with me, please, as we begin Luke chapter 15 with verse 8. Suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Does she not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Thank you. you. may be seated. When was the last time you lost something really valuable? Now, I don't necessarily mean some object that costs you a lot of money. I'm talking about um, a keepsake of some kind, a... Um, uh, a gift somebody gave you, uh, a family heirloom, a priceless photograph. It, it, it didn't cost a lot of money, but it's something valuable just the same. What, what did you do? Well, you might have done what a lot of people do. When you discovered it was lost, you dropped everything else and started looking for it. You looked under the bed. You looked behind the dresser. You looked in, looked in the dirty clothes hamper. You looked in the car. You retraced your steps. If that object was really valuable to you, you left no stone unturned in your efforts to find it again. Because whether or not that stone stayed, uh, that, that object stayed lost depended upon whether or not you did certain things. When our dog Gabby wants me to play with her, she will bring her ball and drop it at my feet. And if I ignore her, she will pick it up and drop it again. And pick it up and drop it again. And pick it up and drop it again. Until I just about go crazy. So I say, okay, okay, we'll, we'll play for just a minute. It's kind of funny too. I'm, if I'm in my, my desk at, home, at my desk at home and I'm working, she will bring one toy. And she wants, to, wants me to hold it and play tug with her. And then she gets tired of that one and she go gets, goes and gets another toy until uh, when I stand up from that chair, my chair is just surrounded by all these dog toys. But if she can't, if she wants to play with the ball in particular, 
uh, she'll bring it to me and, 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 and drops it so, until I pick it up. Uh, but if she can't find it, if she can't find her ball, she comes to me and woof, woof, over again until finally I just say, okay, let's, let's do it. And we go look for that little ball. And I say, I don't know where it is. You go find it. And she'll run up and down the hall looking for it. We'll go, from, we'll go all over the house from one end of it to the other. I, I may remember seeing it last in the kitchen. So we go into the kitchen and she looks all around there. Maybe got kind of caught up under the cabinets and she'll find it. Um, then we'll go down the hall. And she'll look in first one room, then the other. She goes, runs in and looks in the usual places and then she runs out. Uh, we'll go in the bedroom and I'll point to the bed and I'll say, look under the bed. And she'll go under the bed and see if she can find it. Sometimes it's there. Um, I'll say, look under my desk. And so she crawls under there. Sometimes that's where it is. Um, her, you see, her, her entire world is wrapped up at that moment in whether or not we can locate that little glow-in-the-dark ball. Sometimes I just want to say, just wait till nighttime and we can find it then. <laughs> Well, finally she spots it. What was lost is now found. And the play begins. One of the parables here that Jesus told in this chapter was of this woman who lost ten pieces of silver, uh, had ten pieces of silver and lost one of them. Jesus describes her feverish efforts to reclaim what is lost. If that lost coin was to be found again, then she was going to have to do certain things. She stopped everything else that she was doing. She lit a candle. She swept the house and searched diligently until she found it. And from that one verse in which Jesus describes what she did, Luke 15, 8, uh, we find some imperatives for us that we cannot ignore if we're going to reclaim what is lost for our Heavenly Father. Whether lost people right here in our community are ever found are ever saved, or whether they will be forever separated from God, may depend vitally upon whether or not we as children of God do certain things. I want to show you two of those today and we'll take the other two next week. First of all, we must make the winning of souls a priority. I, I, I realize when preachers start talking like this, a lot of people get nervous. Almost more nervous than you get when a preacher talks about money. But we must make the winning of souls a priority. The first thing that the woman in the parable did was to make it a priority. Finding that coin. Now Jesus doesn't say whether or not she was entertaining friends or cooking a meal or doing the wash. When she discovered that that coin was lost, she dropped everything. Whatever she was doing, and she focused her entire attention on finding it. Why so much fuss over a coin worth about 20 cents in our, day, our money today? Worth about 20 cents? Well, this one coin was equal to a man's wages for a whole day in Palestine. So she had lost a whole day's pay. That would be enough uh, right there to go looking for it. But there was a lot more to it than that. The mark of a married woman was a headdress made of ten silver coins. And it was, they were linked together with a silver chain and she kind of wore it right here around her head. Now a single girl would save her money until she could gather those ten silver coins because that headdress was the equivalent of a wedding ring. When she finally had those ten coins, they were hers forever. They couldn't even be taken away from her uh, to pay a debt. If she had nothing else left, they couldn't even take that. Uh, when she finally had them, no one could take them from her. So it could be that it was one of those ten coins that the woman in Jesus' parable had lost. And so she searched for it, as any of you ladies might search for your wedding ring, if you discovered that it was lost. She had to find it. It meant everything to her. Jesus was in the habit of stopping everything he was doing to tend to the needs of only one individual. And, you know, he emphasizes one sheep, one coin, one son. But he practiced it too. There was the woman in Mark 5 who had been bleeding for 12 years and had spent all of her money, all of her money on doctors, but she only got worse and worse. 
She reached out to Jesus one day in, in, in a crowd in the hope that if she could just touch the hem of his garment, that she would be healed. The scripture says that Jesus stopped when she touched the hem, the, the very hem of his garment, that Jesus stopped. He said he felt that power had gone out from him. And he looked to see who had touched him. He stopped everything that he was doing in order to reclaim this one soul for his father. There was Nicodemus in John chapter 3 who came to Jesus at night and asked him, How can a man be born again? And Jesus took enough time to speak to just one man and tell him how he could be saved. And that conversation may be among the most famous in the world. In Mark chapter 10, there's the story of Jesus walking along the road followed by a huge crowd when a blind man named Bartimaeus cried out from the side of the road, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Over and over and over again. Kind of like Gabby, drop, picking up that ball and dropping it. Bartimaeus kept calling out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. The scriptures tell us that, that, that Jesus stood still. And he told the people standing there to call the man to him. And when the man got there and Jesus heard what Bartimaeus was asking, Jesus healed him and gave him sight. Again, he took time to stop what he was doing to reclaim one person for his Heavenly Father. Too many times, the church has become engrossed with non-essential things which do nothing to help us accomplish the goal that God has given us. Too often we get sidetracked from the real task that Jesus has handed to us. Several years ago, the uh, one Sunday, the family circus comic strip caught my eye. Uh, the mother is standing there holding the telephone up to her head in one hand, and she's pointing to her son with the other and saying, uh, run get a pencil for me, Billy. She's, uh, she, she, needs, she needs a pencil. She's using one of those phones that was still wired up to the receiver. She says, run get a pencil for me, Billy. Hurry. So the little boy says, okay, Mom, and he runs into the next room, and he checks with his, his sister. Um, but she's, she's sitting at the table, and she only has colors. So he goes to a bureau, and he looks through all the drawers, and he runs up the stairs and down the hall, and he stops to take a little target practice with his dartboard. He jumps on his bed a little, few times before looking in his desk drawer, and then he goes into the nursery to play with his little baby brother. He comes downstairs, he sees a comic book, and he pauses long enough to leaf through it. He helps his, uh, his older brother with a puzzle, and uh, then he stops to check who's winning the basketball game on television. And then he sees some friends outside through the window, he runs to the closet to get his jacket, and then rushes outside to play. And the last we see of little Billy, his mother's still waiting for a pencil, he's running out of the door shouting, Hey you guys! <laughs> he got sidetracked. Billy, I need a pencil. Okay. We start off. Church, we need more people in the kingdom. Okay. And we start off. And we get busy for a little while. And then we get sidetracked. God commands us to win people to Christ. To spread the good news of His Son's death and resurrection. And we say, okay, God. And then we get sidetracked on a lot of different things. Our gatherings at the church become little more than social events. And while we enjoy and appreciate... Uh, Christian fellowship, we tend to forget that there are still people out there who need Jesus. We get sidetracked in dealing with the business of the church and we've forgotten that the business of the church is bringing people into the kingdom of God. When we say that we should make the winning of souls a priority, we mean that we must stop anything that does nothing to help us with our main task. Hmm. If the church's purpose is to reach people for Jesus, then the things that we do should support that overall goal. It doesn't mean that we offer the plan of salvation to every, men, uh, every event or every meeting. It means that we never forget that the decisions we make the nominating committee we vote on, the budget that we develop, every deacon's meeting, 
the festival in the fall, the Easter egg hunt in the spring, even covered dish meals, they all become a part of our overall strategy to reach people for Christ. They all become a part of that. It means that we never forget why we're here. We have to see people the way, the way God sees them. We, we have to see that God loves them and, and, and God cherishes them and that He rejoices with all the angels in heaven when one of them comes back to Him. Just one individual is worth all the trouble and expense. We've got to become more like that woman who lost that single solitary coin. We must stop whatever we're doing that doesn't help us accomplish our goal and focus more and more of our attention and resources to winning the lost around us. Is that lost neighbor or friend or family member going to stay lost? Or will he or she ever be found? That may depend on us. It may depend on us upon whether or not we will stop long enough and give this priority, take a good long look at, at who we are as a church and, and who we really are as followers of Christ. And, and, and do we dare eliminate anything that causes us to become ineffective in sharing that message? We have to give it priority. Secondly, we must allow God's light to fill our own lives. We want other people to be saved, we've got to make sure that we're walking right with God too. Now the woman in the parable had to light a candle before she could begin her search. From what we know about homes in Israel at the time, it would seem that it would not be difficult at all to lose a silver coin in one of them. If, if one of those coins came loose off of that headdress, off of that silver chain, then uh, it would be difficult to find them. The houses were very dark. Uh, because they were usually lit by one circular window, usually only about 18 inches across. So there wasn't a whole lot of light that got in there. The earth was beaten earth, just dirt, covered with dried reeds or rushes or straw. To look for a single coin in, in a room like that would have been literally like looking for a needle in a haystack. If you lost anything, particularly something as small as a coin, you would have to light a lamp or a candle before even beginning your search. Now, we find very quickly that before we can lead anyone to Christ, who is the light of the world, we must be walking in the light with Jesus ourselves. That makes sense, doesn't it? We cannot lead anyone to the light if we are in the darkness. This woman had to light a candle so she could search in the darkness. You and I must allow ourselves to be more and more exposed to the light that God sheds. 1 John 1.5 reads like this. God is light. And no shadow of darkness can exist in Him. Paul connected the light of Jesus to the kind of witness that we give for him. In 2 Corinthians 4, 6, he said, God, who first ordered light to shine out of darkness, has flooded our hearts with his light. We now can enlighten men only because we can give them knowledge of the glory of God as we see it in the face of Jesus Christ. It comes to us, so now we can share it. We are to reflect the light of of Christ. That's what Jesus meant when he said that, that those who follow him are the light of the world. Those who, he says, I am the light of the world. And then he says, those who follow me are the light of the world. How can that be? It's because he is the light and our function is like a mirror. And we are to reflect the light of Christ as we see it revealed in, in, our, in, in His face. So, I read somewhere that a mirror's function is just simply to reflect the image of the person or the object in front of it. That's all it does. A mirror's function is not to call attention to itself. It's not there just so, it, so everybody pass in front of it. It says, hey, look at me, look at me. Because me is you, you see. If... if if the mirror can't say, I'm all, it's all about me, when we look in a mirror, it's not about the mirror, it's about us. You see? So, 
The only time that a mirror might call attention to itself is when it has a flaw in it. And it wasn't made, smoothed out properly, or maybe the, the silver on the inside started to flake off. It's an old mirror and it started to come loose. Or maybe, uh, maybe it's been broken. And we look at that flaw and we see the flaw rather than the image that's, that it's supposed to be uh, projecting. Listen to what Paul said in Philippians 2. Verses 14 through 16, he said, Do everything without complaining or arguing, so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God, without fault, in a crooked and depraved generation. And listen to this part. In which you shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the word of life. Beautiful words. You see, our function... Our function as followers of Christ is to be like the mirror. Not calling attention to ourselves unless we are flawed by our own sin. That's a responsibility, folks. A huge responsibility. As we allow God's light to fill up our lives and expose our sins in His light, then we can be made fit to live and serve in the kingdom of God. No, no longer are we walking in darkness. We have light for our paths. Jesus said, Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Please listen to what Paul said in Ephesians chapter 5. Oh, goodness, there we are in Ephesians again. But it's been a few months since we were in Ephesians chapter 5, and this passage is really pertinent to what we want to talk about today. Ephesians 5, 8 through 14, he's been describing the kind of sins that don't have any place in a believer's life. Sexual immorality, greed, any kind of impurity, obscenity, foolish talk, and so forth. But then he says, once you were darkness, but now you are light. Live then as children of the light. The light produces in men quite the opposite of sins like these. Everything that is wholesome and good and true. Let your lives be living proofs of the things which please God. Oh wow. What a powerful statement that is. I read that again this morning and I thought, good gracious, I, that is so powerful. Let your lives be living proofs of the things which please God. Steer clear of the activities of darkness. Let your lives show by contrast how dreary and futile these things are. For light is capable of showing up everything for what it really is. It is even possible for light to turn the thing it shines upon into light also. You think of that woman lighting a candle in her dark one-room house. It may be that as soon as that candle is lit, that the light will hit that little silver coin and she'll see, she'll see the glint and reflection of it immediately and the coin is found. It could very well be, folks, it could very well be that someone is watching you. And they're watching your life. And as soon as you dare to step out into God's revealing light, that person too will follow you. The light will reflect, the light of Christ will reflect off of you, and you will be a reflection of Christ. So, lost or found? Lost or found? The woman stopped what she was doing, she gave priority to her search. And she lit a candle so she could see better. If you and I are to win lost people to Christ, then we must become serious about it. We must become serious about it. We must allow nothing to sidetrack us from the great commission that's been given to us by our Lord Jesus. Nothing should, should uh, conflict with that. Nothing should interfere with it. It should, always, it. it should always be our uppermost goal. And we ourselves must be exposed to the revealing light of the gospel. 
I realize that that's a hard concept for a lot of people to take in. But I've I have known churches that once they w once they eat, they got serious about this. They got serious about it. They took a long, hard look at everything they were doing, every event, every ministry, every committee, and they asked themselves the question, how does what that committee do help us to win people to Christ? How does having that event help us win people to Christ? How does singing that song or or this order of service or that sermon or these flowers, how do they help us win people to Christ? And you know as that church took a good long look at it, they determined that there were several things they were doing that were just draining resources but were not helping them do anything. <laughs> weren't helping them win people. They weren't more faithful stewards of what God had given because they had this event or that one. And so they began to eliminate some of them. If they could not sit down and come up with a, a, a plan for using that event, they began cutting it out. You know the first thing to go? Their softball team. Oh, there were some folks that fussed about that, but they determined that that's their softball team was not doing anything to enhance their witness. It was only hurting it. And they cut out their softball team. And they took those resources and that time spent and they began to focus it on other things. It began to be focused and, and, uh, and channeled into places where it really needed to be. You know folks, we don't have a softball team. But we may have some other things that we do. And, and it's just, I'm just challenging Sunday school teachers. Does your class, does your class help other people come to know Christ? The Harvest Supper? Easter egg hunt? Anything, anything that we do. The people in charge of those events, I'm challenging you not to cut it out, not to eliminate it. I'm challenging you to take a good long look and when you're planning, when you're doing your, your, you're looking at your calendar and trying to decide all these different things that have to be done. Ask yourself also, how can this event be used to win people to Christ. I want to tell you something. One of our main purposes of being here is that very purpose. And if we're not faithful to that, we have no reason to be here. Folks, this is difficult. This, this is difficult. Because it takes a good long look at ourselves and we have to be really deeply honest with ourselves about who we are and who we really want to be. It's important for us to take the time. Take the time. Make it a priority and make sure that the light of Jesus is shining on our lives and that we're clean enough and not flawed with our own personal sins so that we can reflect it back out so the world can see it. Pray with me please. Heavenly Father, we come to you today and we thank you, Lord, for loving us, for being with us, for being patient with us. We thank you, Lord, for the fact that you, you show us in your word that one person, one person is important enough to you for you to stop everything else you were doing and give it your full attention. We, we pray, Lord, you'll help us as your people. To be faithfully sure about our purpose for being here. The things that we do. The activities that we engage in. I pray Lord that you'll help us to realize this is, this is part of our purpose for being here. This church has been here on this corner a long, long time Lord. And we thank you for that. We thank you and praise you for the foresight and the vision that people had a long time ago. For a, a strong Bible believing body of believers right here in Utica. We pray, Lord, that we might still be faithful to that task and that, Lord, that you will be pleased with the things that we do. I pray now, Lord, as we come to our time of invitation, Father, that you will speak to our hearts. Speak to us, Father, about the roles that you would have us play in your kingdom. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. You come with Come as we stand to sing.
I thank you so much for being here today. Uh, tonight uh, at 6 o'clock, we're going to be continuing our study on forgiveness. We've come to that portion that says how to forgive. How to forgive. And if you need something like that, I hope that you can be here tonight. 6 o'clock. Now, it's time for our blessing. I see those hands back there. <laughs> the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn His face toward you and give you peace. Amen. Thank you.